welcome to the session two, the parallel sessions of the forum. Uh, this morning, we heard from Professor Baldwin and uh, uh, about the new globalization, the Globotics upheaval. And then um, after that, we heard two country experiences, one from Estonia, the experience um, from uh, Calum Cameron, and then also the experience of the Philippine Sea, um, uh, uh, as discussed by uh, Justice Carpio. Uh, so this afternoon, we are going to look at specific uh, issues related to this new globalization, so in four different parallel sessions. The, the session that is assigned to us is, or first let me tell you about the four uh, issues or related to this new globalization. So uh, first is worsening inequality, and then the second is global trade restructuring. Third is the challenges to the underprovision of the global public goods. And then the fourth is weakening of social cohesion and trust. So for among so for these four, the one that is assigned to us is uh, global trade restructuring. And uh, we will hear about uh, specific discussions on what is going on in the global landscape. And um, in order for us to prepare or understand uh, what is driving this, and also what could be the strategies that the Philippines could um, do in order to maximize or at the opportunities and prepare for the risks. So let's hear from the first speaker. Uh, the first speaker is going to talk about the impact of trade conflict on developing Asia. The first speaker is a research associate of the Asian Development Bank uh, since the beginning of 2018. And she has expertise in international trade, global value chains, and energy capacity building. She was a she was previously a project finance manager for Bird's Energy Consulting. Uh, she, she holds a Bachelor of Science in Management from the Ateneo de Manila University and a double master's degree, Magna Cum Laude, in International Business and Economics from the University of Pavia in Italy and Stras Strasbourg University in France. So uh, let, uh, please welcome Ms. Uh, Christina Barris who will talk about the impact of trade conflict in developing Asia. Hi everyone, it's my pleasure to share with you today our views on Asia's outlook and the impact of the trade war on developing Asia. So it's no, uh, it's no surprise we're discussing this today because it's constantly been on the headlines and everyone is concerned about the impact of the trade war on their individual countries. So we published this working paper in December 2018 and then we keep updating it based on the latest tariff actions. We'll be publishing this as a topic piece in the Asian Development Outlook 2019 update next week. Today I will highlight some of the key developments and the key findings. So the trade conflict began in January 2018 when the U.S. imposed uh, tariffs on solar panels and washing machines that's worth about 8.5 and 1.8 billion. And then again in March 22, they imposed 20% steel tariffs and 10% aluminum tariffs against all its trading partners who then retaliated with tariffs of their own. On April 2, China retaliated with tariffs on about 3 billion of US goods. And then the trade conflict from then on in, uh, became more bilateral and it escalated in the second and third quarters of 2018. And then in May, the U.S. Uh, imposed, uh, so in July 6 and um, August 23, the U.S. imposed additional tariffs on China worth about 34 billion and 16 billion, that's a total of 50 billion, and China retaliated tit for tat effective the same day. And then September 24, the U.S. imposed 10% uh, tariffs on 200 billion of Chinese goods. China retaliated with 5 to 10% on 60 billion. So the difference in the size is reflective of the fact that PRC imports only about 129 billion from US and the US impos uh, imports about 539.7 billion. 
And following a trade truce in December 2018, in May 10, U.S. imposed additional uh, additional tariff increases on the 200 billion from uh, 10 percent to 25 percent, and then PRC retaliated again on uh, June 1. They increased the tariff levels in the 60 billion from 5 to 10 to 10 percent up to 10, 20, and 25 percent. And then on August 1, U.S. imposed 10 percent tariffs on 300 billion of Chinese goods. So that effectively covers all PRC exports to the U.S. And the latest tariff actions were on August 23, PRC imposed 5 to 10 percent tariffs on 75 billion which will take effect in two stages. The first, uh, 28.7 billion on September 1, and then 45.5 billion on December 15. And US retaliated by increasing the levels of tariffs on the 550 billion. So the 300 billion will now have tariff increases from 10% to 15%. And the 200 billion will have tariff increases from 25% to 30% effective October 15. And uh, the trade conflict is not just between U.S. and PRC. So major trading partners of steel by U.S. retaliated with tariffs of their own. And WTO has recently sided with the EU. So the U.S. is currently preparing about 21 billion list of goods that will be subject to tariffs. And also looming on the horizon, the U.S. is investigating auto tariffs. That's worth about 350 billion against the world and according to the European Commission, the retaliation by other countries could amount up to 294 billion. So recently, the auto tariffs has been postponed until November 13, but uh, the US is currently negotiating trade deals with EU and uh, US, EU, Japan and other countries. So uh, in our model, we think of trade as global value chains, and this is how we quantified our tariffs. So we quantified the tariff measures as working their way all the all through the local and international supply chains. And we thought of economies not as separate entities, but as interconnected units within a complex value chain. And this is a network analysis chart. It's a representation of GVC linkages within the world. These are the top 35 countries with the strongest GVC linkages, that's global value chain linkages. And as you can see, US and PRC are two of the three main hubs in, uh, in global production. And also US and PRC are the world's two largest economies and the world's two largest traders, together accounting for two-fifths of global GDP and a quarter of global trade. And so therefore, it's important for us to quantify the risks of the tariff measures because they will have spill over spillover effects all over the world. The size of the nodes were based on domestic value added uh, that's embedded in the, in the production trade. And the thickness of the edges were based on domestic value added that's uh, in the bilateral trade of one node, one country to another. So for our methodology, the goal is to analyze the tariff measures not just the global and regional effects so we wanted to look at the impact on the individual countries and the individual sectors within these countries and for uh, our analysis we examined three channels through which the tariffs can affect economies first is the direct effect of the tariffs on the products and the countries that are subject to the tariffs and then there's the indirect effects via production linkages so the producers that now sell fewer intermediate goods by fewer, uh, fewer intermediate inputs from their suppliers. So these are your spillover effects all the way along the supply chain. And then there's the possibility of trade redirection. So this, uh, in this situation, some countries actually benefit indirectly because um, these uh, countries and suppliers will, uh, will get the gains from the trade conflict. Uh, because they already produce the goods that are subject to the tariffs but are exempted from the tariffs. Now, three separate trade conflict scenarios were examined. The first is the current scenario that's a trade war as it currently stands, which includes all the tariff measures uh, implemented as of today. 
And then there's the bilateral escalation scenario wherein the US and PRC imposes a blanket tariffs of 30% against each other. And then there is what we call the worst case scenario in which the US imposes 25% auto tariffs against the world and the world retaliates. And in our analysis, we rely on ADB's multi-regional input-output table. We use the 2017, it documents trade and production linkages for 35 sectors for uh, 62 countries plus the rest of the world, including 24 economies in developing Asia. And here's a simplified methodology. So first, we calculated the direct effects. Uh, we take the list of tariff-affected goods and also the, uh, the magnitude of tariff change as well as their trade data all at the six-digit level. And then we used the price elasticities of import demand from Tokarik to calculate for the implied reduction in import demand values. And then we redistribute import demand for, uh, for the possibility of trade redirection. And what we did is the drop in the market share for the, um, for the affected countries will be redistributed to the domestic sectors of the importing country and to the unaffected countries using market share. And the second step is we calculated for the indirect effects using input-output analysis. So this is the basic framework of um, uh, an imp input-output table. So it documents production linkages for 35 sectors within an economy. In, an, in a multi-regional input-output table, the flow of economic transactions between the country sectors in the row and the purchasing sectors in the column is summarized. And so the input-output tables provide the recipes for production. And we calculated for the change in output that will be attributable to the change in intermediate use and final demand after applying the changes in the import demand values. I can talk about this longer later. So let's look at the effects. Let's first look at the global effects and work our way down. Uh, the bars on the left show your direct effects of the tariffs and the indirect effects via production linkages. And the bars on the right allows for the possibility of trade redirection. The blue bar shows the estimated GDP, GDP impact uh, under the current scenario. And then the second bar shows your bilateral escalation. The third bar shows your auto tariff escalation. The red bar shows your, uh, the sum of impacts under the worst case scenario. And here you can see that even the current tariffs have already had an effect on the global economy, taking off about 0.1% of global GDP. And uh, bilateral escalation will double that, and auto tariff escalation will double that again. So that under the worst case scenario, about 0.3 to 0.55% of global GDP will be lost depending on the extent of trade redirection that should occur. Now, most of the negative global impacts actually reflect the negative effects on PRC and US, the two main protagonists. So PRC and US will be the biggest losers in the trade war. And you can see here, PRC has lost 0.65% due to the tariffs already implemented, and the bilateral escalation will increase it to about one3 the auto tariff escalation will increase that to 1.25% of their GDP. And the effect on US is smaller, but it's still negative. About 0.13% currently, the bilateral escalation will increase, increase that to 024 And the auto tariff escalation will increase that to about 027 of GDP. And the difference in the effects is uh, not surprising given the larger size of the tariffs imposed by US and also the greater dependence of China on US demand. And you can also see that the direct effects and the indirect effects are the largest. So the trade redirection towards the domestic sectors of these two economies will provide only a marginal boost, less than 0.05% of their GDP. Now, focusing on the regions, for the rest of developing Asia outside China, the, the effects of direct and indirect channels will be negative, but it will be really negligible. It will be relatively quantitatively small. For none of these countries does it exceed 0.22%, and the region's uh, loss will be only be about 0.07%. And when one allows for the possibility of trade redirection, the net impact for developing Asia actually turns very slightly positive. So you can see that for the Philippines, the net impact is a gain of about 0.15%, 
and the biggest net gainer will be Vietnam. Vietnam will see boosts of about 0.58% to its economy. And under the worst case scenario, the patterns are similar, but the magnitudes are larger. You can see here for the Philippines, the net impact is about 0.18% gain. And the biggest winners will be Vietnam, Taipei, China, and Malaysia, because these economies already produce and export those goods similar to what China produces that are already or may soon be subject to the tariffs. So for developing Asia, most of the gains will arrive through electronics, textiles, and garments. Under the, worst, under the current scenario, Vietnam will gain, and most of the gains will arrive through textiles and garments. And then under the bilateral escalation scenario, the biggest gainers will be Vietnam, Taipei, China, and Malaysia largely due to redirection of electronics and machinery trade. And for the Philippines, it's a gain of about 0.24%, again, mostly through electronics and machinery, about 0.05% under the current scenario and 0.07% under the bilateral escalation scenario. And looking at the impact on the Philippines, uh, the, the services that will gain the most will be manufacturing. The net effect on Philippine agriculture, the three bars on the, on the left, is really small. And similarly, for services, the effects will be small. So most of the gains will arrive through manufacturing, and it can be anywhere between 0 0.1 to 0.17% of the sectoral GVA, gross value added. And um, comparing Philippine manufacturing gains with uh, our peers, you can see here that we may be net gainers and we're not at the bottom of the pack, but we're still not the ones who gain the most. So Thailand, Malaysia, and Vietnam will gain the most again because they already produce and export those goods that US and PRC bil bilaterally trade with each other. And for the Philippines, the gains in manufacturing will be driven by electronics. You can see here that the sector accounts for more than half of the gains in exports and gross value added. And a closer look at the manufacturing sector, these are the goods at the two-digit level that will gain or lose the most under the current scenario. Among the 16 priority se sectors in the strategic investments priorities plan, uh, you can see electronics machinery, apparel and also iron and steel will be most affected. Now it's important to note that iron and steel will lose about 0.04% of the sector's exports and it's part of our top priorities. Under the worst case scenario, the gains will be somewhat more evenly spread. And this shows who we're competing with among our peers in terms of our trade with the US and PRC. You can see Vietnam will be our biggest competitor again because they produce goods complementary to the US PRC bilateral trade. And under the worst case scenario, Malaysia will capture a bigger share of the gain. Now, some important caveats and limitations. First, our estimates conservatively assume that half, only half of the trade will be redirected. And also, it may take a while for some of these effects to materialize, particularly supply chain effects and trade redirection, because the underlying investment decisions often take many years in the making. Also, the analysis did not take into account the potential opening of new trade channels. For example, in Asia, there is Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, Asia-Pacific Trade Agreement, CPTPP. Also in the making is uh, the EU-US Zero Tariff Deal, EU-Japan Trade Agreement, EU-Singapore Free Trade Agreement, also US-Mexico-Canada Trade Deal. And also, the analysis does not take into account the effects that work through confidence and future investment. So the extent of economic disruption as global trade is reallocated, and the greater economic uncertainty is difficult to predict, and uh, it's not captured in the channels explored here. So here are our key findings. So US and PRC will be the biggest losers, 0 0.13 and 0 0.65. Escalation of the bilateral trade conflict will double that. Auto tariff escalation will double that again. Confidence shocks will amplify the risks by a large amount. And then developing Asia will have negative effects, but it will be too small 
so that potential gain from trade redirection can more than offset this. And the Philippine manufacturing will see gains of up to 0.1 to 0.2% primarily in electronics, but our ASEAN peers tend to gain more. Now, the bilateral trade data from uh, the beginning of this year until June show already the impact of the trade conflict on the two pro protagonists, UNPRC, US and PRC. PRC exports to the US have already contracted 30 to 40 percent year on year, and US exports to the PRC have contracted by a similar magnitude. And also, recent trade data already provide evidence of trade redirection. US imports from PRC have fallen 20 percent, but its imports from Vietnam, Taipei, and Korea have all risen. And going forward, the prospects are are poor for a resolution because the trade conflict has already broadened. Non-tariff measures are imposed. Um, tariffs are no longer the, bi the biggest problem because uh, non-tariff measures are imposed and uh, the technology and services conflict has begun. So there's the export restrictions, import controls. Uh, there's also investment restrictions and targeting of specific multinational companies such as Huawei. And so, in conclusion, uh, the, the U.S. conflict, U.S.-PRC trade conflict was uh, supposed to protect domestic industries, but imposing tariffs in an interconnected world can backfire, in large part because of the vast global interconnectedness of economies in production and trade. So take, for example, China tariffs on U.S. soybeans. U.S. Soy soybeans are used as pork feeds, and so thereby increasing Chinese pork prices. And at the same time, U.S. multinationals have set up production facilities abroad in tariff-affected countries producing goods for exports, and they remit the profits back to the U.S. And so their exporting goods are likely to be subject to U.S. import tariffs. And so in a world where majority of trade is no longer on final goods used for consumption in foreign countries, Majority of international trade, about 81%, is in inter intermediate goods used for production. So imposing tariffs can backfire. And so, in conclusion, uh, the, the trade conflict is not likely to end soon, given that uh, Trump's tariffs has deep roots. Has, it's based on long-held beliefs that uh, countries large bilateral trade deficit is a sign of a country's weakness. It's not merely a pondering to a constituency or fulfilling campaign promises. He has really deep beliefs that tariffs are needed to protect domestic industries. And for China, China's development success relies on international uh, intellectual property rights, uh, tech transfer, and the role of state-owned enterprises. And so China is not likely to to change its trade and investment policies, given that the effect of the tariffs are ultimately small to seriously affect its 13 trillion economy. Thank you. So we're off to a good start. We've learned about what is going on in the international uh, landscape, how the US is uh, imposing tariffs to its major trade partner, or well, uh, enemy, if you can call it that. But, uh, and how the China is reacting to all these um, tariffs in uh, so many ways. So, I, but this is only just one part of the, the, what is happening in the global world. So it is also important that we should understand um, what is also driving some of these uh, changes in uh, the global landscape in terms of how we trade. So uh, we wish to look at how the developments in technology, particularly in um, financial technology, would be affecting how the Philippines and other countries are trading. So to talk about digitalization, competition, and uh, financial technology, 
we invited speakers from um, FinTech Philippines Association. So the first speaker is a co-founder and a development technology consultant of FinTech Philippines Association. He brings to the table more than 20 years of combined experience in the fields of general consulting, electronic payments, rural banking, microfinance, and community development, with more than 10 years of that in leadership positions as head of department units or regional units at the director, vice president, or senior manager level. So without further ado, let me welcome Jove Tapiador to, to give us his talk. Can I use this one? I mean, mic test. So thank you, Francis. Um, thank you for inviting us to this event, and I'd like to share and discuss uh, our thoughts on on the topic global uh, trade restructuring, but more specifically, how technology will change global business and how it will affect local work. And during the plenary session, we heard how technology will actually change work. And in my presentation, this is just, I'm given only 10 minutes because my colleague uh, will get my 20 minutes. And we will have this combined presentation of a more global, let's say a more national overview, a more, a more specific sectoral perspective on FinTech and financial services. So we've already heard from this morning that there's a net effect of rapid geopolitical, technology, and environmental shifts. And a while ago, we heard uh, Christine, Chris, uh, discuss about the US-China trade war and how it's disrupting uh, supply chain. So I don't need to go into detail about that. But what I'm interested in is sharing to you what the advances of digital technology, how can that affect all areas of life, particularly in our work? Um, but Th although this is not part of my topic, what is not mentioned is that there are also demographic impact of resource loss, especially uh, because of climate change, and how all of these create a VUCA world, which is a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous, in which we are in right now. And that's the reason why the theme for the ACCP conference for the past two years has always been this crazy happenings in the past uh, two or three years. So, but to contextualize technology and what's happening, um, what we're saying here is that now technology is a driver itself of change on the environment, on society, and even on enterprises. And I in fact, I put technology as a much more broader um, perspective because as we progress as an, as an economy, it is actually technology that elevates the productivity of a, of a society uh, in quantum leaps. So for example, what used to be j just using a plow and a cattle, we now have a mechanized tractor which increases productivity multiple times. And it's not in a gradual sloping line. It is a quantum leap from one step to another. And we believe that the same series of technologies that's uh, being introduced now over the past few years will have the same quantum effects across society, enterprises, and the environment. So I'd like to share with you the ABCD threes of change, and uh, that is technology change. And what are these drivers? This morning, you've already heard about A, artificial intelligence, and how machine uh, intelligence will move work from routinary repetitive tasks to more creative tasks. The second one, which my colleague will discuss uh, later, is on blockchain. Um, I don't need to go deep into that. I only have 10 minutes. <laughs> but uh, this was already explained also this morning of how a distributed ledger technology will have a quantum impact on how we store record data and how people access data, which is related also to cloud computing. So who here has a Gmail account or a Yahoo Mail? So all your, all your emails are ready on the cloud. Uh, you use uh, these services on a daily basis, and it's already existing. The fourth one is D, data science. Um, 
So basically, it's the understanding and use or application of data sets for real world um, problems. So for example, uh, Grab. So I'm sure who, who uses Grab almost every day? Okay, so a handful. Essentially, there's a lot of data into it that allows you to determine point A to point B, which is the shortest route. And the fifth one is edge computing or the internet of things, which is now being uh, manufactured and embedded in many devices around the world. And I understand that there will be more than 30 billion of such devices over the next five to six years. Now, what is the three? Can you guess? May A, B, C, D, E. And what's the letter th number three? 3D printing. So I just came from Davao like early this year. They in fact set up a fab lab. It's a small lab where you can actually print objects using some materials and they're printing it layer by layer to create objects, whether that's a tool, whether that's a uh, mold, whether that is uh, a toy, so it's there. So you combine all of these and what you have is our series of technologies that build one on top of the other that are in fact disrupting how we are structured today. What then can be the impact in many of these industries? You've already seen snippets of that, uh, glimmers of change. For example, it has been cited that for the BPO sector, we'll call or voice services um, change, of course, because with artificial intelligence, then it is possible for a human-like uh, discussion or chat with another, with a real person. Um, how about for financial services? That will be the topic of my uh, colleague in a while. You've already seen the impact on transportation, where in fact, oh, sino nang sumasakay dito ng angkas? Wala, isa, dalawa? Okay. I just came, you know, for this week, I've uh, talked with the uh, taxi drivers. A number of them are planning to leave their jobs and become angkas drivers. Why? Because it's not profitable for them anymore. So what I'm saying is, even yung habal-habal sa probinsya, when you take it up, becomes a major change driver in the Philippines, in Manila. It solves a problem. So those are just examples of how technology is actually impacting us now, today, and how much more in the future, in the next two or three years. So if the, uh, if the, prep, if the, if the premise that AI and combined with other technologies will shift blue collar and white collar jobs away from us, how then can we um, adapt? Because what is what will happen now to business models is that it will become automated, it will become 24 seven, it will require higher order skills, it's not just about labor anymore, but it's about creativity and for uh, deep set critical thinking. So for entrepreneurs, how can they adapt to this kind of uh, environment? Now, I'll spend my last two minutes discussing a potential future which is being pushed also by the Department of Information Communications Technology, hence the logo over that corner. So I've sat in a few of their uh, conferences, um, their presentations in the past two months with development partners, private sector players, and other stakeholders. And what we're saying here is that there's nothing less than a fundamental change in how we work, in the places of work, in how government operates, and how classrooms are going to be rolled out, it's not just going to be physical anymore, and ultimately how communities are organized. You've heard about e-Estonia in the plenary session. We are going to do that in very small pilots in the Philippines, or as, that's, well, that's what the DICT is saying. So what we're looking now is a transformation from a cost perspective to a productivity perspective, why? Imagine a call center agent or a BPO worker. Typically, it's in the past, it was just voice. 
but provide that same worker with robotic tools that can take entry-level uh, Q&A and give that person the ability to see through data and have pinpointed discussions, they can increase productivity significantly. What used to be one is to one can be for one BPO worker can do the work of 10 BPO workers. So who here are from the BPO industry? Just one. That can actually solve what they say is a manpower problem because they're having a hard time getting more people. Then why not use technology? Uh, for managing people, now people, now managers, or employers, uh, you know, organizations will need to manage both people and robots. From repetitive tasks to creative tasks, and from education and employment to education and employment, meaning that you are now in a continuous learning mode. So if in the past there used to be a distinction between going to school and then going to work, what is happening now is the continuous learning as a means for competitive advantage. So I just talked to a friend there at Inquire Academy and say, said, you know, let's work together. Let's see wha how we can collaborate for ICT industry upskilling because that is what is needed. Imagine millions of workers going to the next level learning data science, learning artificial intelligence, learning blockchain. And that is not a pipe dream. One organization has already piloted that and in six months, they were able to churn out data scientists, blockchain developers, and AI experts in six months. So it can be done. There are pilots that, hap that is happening now and uh, we can see that perhaps rolled out in multiple locations. So time is up and I'll give this next 20 minutes to my colleague. But can I ask for two more minutes? Okay, thank you, Ida. <laughs> my takeaway is this. Um, even LinkedIn, which is tracking the rising skills in the Philippines, has already identified front-end web development, human-centered design, and social media marketing as the top three rising skills in the country. And as you can see, it's not your traditional job. It is the jobs, these are the jobs or the skills needed in the near future, in the next two, three years, actually in the next 12 months. And the demand is significant. Front-end web development, 13 times the average demand. Human-centered design, five times. Social media marketing, four times. There are not enough people trained on these skills. So the way forward, especially for the millennial and Gen Zs, would be to get into these kinds of skill sets because these are the things that are needed for a digital Philippines. And so this was presented by the ICT. This is how they integrate it. And what they're saying is at the very core of a digital economy, society, and governance is connectivity, cybersecurity and the national plan and policies uh, that need to be crafted because there are so many gaps in our cyber laws and digital laws that these will have to be um, in stitched in together perhaps as a Magna Carta for a digital Philippines. So to end, since we're in a policy conference, all I'm saying is we may have elements of these, telecommuting, telecommuting act that allows people to work outside of the traditional office, Philippine Innovation Act and Innovative Startup Act, which were signed into law just a few months back, and the implementing rules are actually going to be rolled out. Oh, by the way, tomorrow, September 20, SMR at the gig, there's a public consultation on the implementing rules of the Innovative Startup Act. So just for your information. But at the end of the day, um, what we're looking now is that we need to look for more connections or connectivity or quality connectivity. And how can we um, roll out more broadband capacity? Incentivize companies to invest in upskilling and technology, not just fiscal incentives, but non-fiscal incentives, because at the core, it's really about investing in people. And uh, thank you.
Uh, you take this one. So you, my colleague. Yes, uh, let me introduce her first. But isn't that a, a great explanation of the fourth industrial revolution technologies that we have heard um, last year uh, in the previous APPC, we heard about, that's a really good acronym, no? the ABCDE3. So um, we heard about all these um, technologies and how it's going to affect the economy and also how it's affecting the way we work. Um, so we try to look at a more specific um, case for the Philippines through another speaker also from the Fintech Philippines Association. And to talk about the borderless, um, a borderless world, is the Philippines ready? We, we will hear from a trustee also of the Fintech Philippines Association and the president of a multi-billion ING informed special purpose vehicle company, Opal Portfolio Investments, Inc. Uh, she is part, uh, also a board of directors of the FinTech Global Resources Incorporated and a board member also of the FinTech Philippines Association and FinTech Alliance. So without further ado, let me call on Ms. Imelda Tiongson to give us her talk. I'm going to move over here because I'm more on this side. Oh, okay. Am I covering? Are you, can you guys see? Are we fine? Ah, okay. Don't count pa, ha? My minutes. <laughs> I would normally talk for an hour and a half minimum, eh? Then I'm given 20 minutes. Okay. Um, bit of a background about myself. I'm basically a banker. What? National Australia Bank, Philippine National Bank, 22 years. And um, after leaving Philippine National Bank, I got pirated by um, ING Foreign Company. It's called Opal Investment. And from there, I became a, a publicly listed director of a couple of um, companies. We basically turn around um, uh, distressed assets, uh, distressed companies. So from there, I actually, in 2016, I did a master class in, in crypto, in blockchain, and digitalization, which people thought I was a little bit crazy then. Um, but I got invited also to do an ICO, initial coin offering, that was in Malaysia. And that's where I learned a few, what's happening in the world. And uh, within 30 minutes, we got a 3 billion uh, Philippine peso equivalent in terms of the funding that was fairly quick for this particular case. But I later found out about um, th the whole world, um, became a director also of, of a P2P lending platform called FinTech Global Resources. So from a traditional banker to now uh, more into FinTech, I thought of sharing, and I've been actually sharing this. I, y m some of you may have seen me as a speaker in a lot of the other events. Okay. Do I have to actually be there? It's not, it's not going. Okay, so uh, in terms of the topic, I'm gonna talk about quickly, um, printed money to digital money. I'm gonna talk about different types of uh, digital currencies, fiat versus cryptocurrency, global trend, um, and uh, the different types of tokenization as well. And I'm gonna um, put a little bit of the Philippine updates and what needs to be done, which is a request of um, AVPC. It's not. All right. Um, not going to talk about fourth industrial revolution. You already know that. Uh, but certainly, when it comes to the digital uh, economy, we know. Um, may I see some hands up? Who's got QR or e wallet here or QR code? This is good. Um, this time last year, when I was actually asking, barely one, one or two. Now uh, I could say about 15%, maybe next year it'll be more 100%. But certainly that medyo luma na ngayon eh. It's actually fairly old already. It's um, your payment system. QR code is basically that cryptic um, like jigsaw where you can just zap. Um, I will be talking more about the financial uh, activities on this as well. So we're actually mo gearing away from from uh, paper money to digital money. Paperless, and that's according to the World Economic Forum, what's happening to the world. You know what, this is not working. I have to move there. Okay. All right. 
I'm gonna go first on the stats. Where this? What is taking so long? Where do I click here? For for a techie person, not so techie here. Um, all right, it's. Creating an ecosystem is what we're trying to do. You, you've seen Estonia, they already created an ecosystem. We are doing that, we're on baby stage in the Philippines. And with that, it's actually a combination of data analytics and AI, I'm not gonna talk into that, uh, talk about that since people have spoken about that. Um, it, it does take me an hour to talk about data analytics, I'm an analytic person, and another hour on AI. Um, I just have a minor investment in an AI company as well now. Okay, global investment. Um, Philippines alone, can you believe it? We're already on the 160 billion. And in 20, uh, as predicted by DTI, in 2030, it's gonna be 1.9 trillion economic impact. But let's uh, digest this a little bit. Um, let's look at the January to December of last year in terms of the QR only by the Chinese and the locals. And if you can actually compare that, we're looking at, if you check this out, compared to that, that's approximately 3,000 pesos per person. Here, it's only about 240 pesos per person. But this is way higher in terms of the percentage that is lower at this point, but for the first half of 2019, that has increased dramatically but it's still re uh, retaining or about 2,800 per person compared to 300 per person there. Um, Chinese QR has actually increased by 300%, while the total increase, if you annualize this, that's a 350% increase. We're talking about ordinary payments um, uh, under the QR. We're not yet even talking about the crypto at this point. Um, just side information, in terms of the uh, tourism, we are actually seeing a lot of the Chinese people, oh, well, it's, um, it's uh, evident anyway, if you actually go to the malls. Um, slightly lower as far as Japan, but still our number one. FYI, so if we're actually looking at that growth, we will be looking at more of the Chinese people um, using QR code uh, locally. Now, I wanna show you a, um, all right, total trade of the Chinese people in the Philippines has actually increased as well. This is total trade, not necessarily digital, but FYI only. Okay, so first is what is digital money? I'm gonna spend, okay. Um, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time with this slide first, because first, I, I feel that not a lot of people are aware of the digital money. They think if you talk about FinTech, it's crypto. Actually, that's not the case. There are two types of digital money. One is called fiat. Does anyone, has anyone heard of the fiat terminology? Fiat is local currency. So if we say fiat, it could be USD in US, you know, the typical local currencies. So we're talking about Philippine, uh, Philippine currency, PHP. In Philippine currency, digital money is via app or QR. So that's the, the numbering that we're tracking down. But at the same time, there's actually crypto. And with the crypto, the most popular, of course, is Bitcoin. But in offerings, coin offerings, the more popular one is Ethereum. There's huge potential there. I'm going to explain why. Potential when it comes to investments, potential on the rewards, and potential on the, uh, building the ecosystem. Um, I want to start first with the easier one, which is a stable coin. I'm pretty sure you've heard of it because you've heard of Libra right? Libra of Facebook, which is currently on hold. You must have heard of, um, and this is only last week, Coinbase just issued a USDC. That's another stable coin. In the Philippines, maybe you haven't heard, but the subsidiary of Union Bank, there is UBX. It's, it's called PHX. So in the first place, what is a stable coin? See, the problem with a crypto coin, and I'm not selling cryptos, and I'm not even promoting cryptocurrencies, incidentally, but basically what we're saying is the difference is the problem with the cryptos is over fluctuation. Hence, the stable coin, what they did or what they're doing is to attach a collateral. So it could be like in the banking world, like a cash holdout, or it could be the bank is a collateral. So that's the heart of the stable coin, so it doesn't fluctuate as much. In short, you will have one of these days a fiat and a crypto 
you won't even know that it's even crypto. If it's PHX, it's PHX because it's pegged in Philippine pesos because you have collateral behind it. So that's the easy part. Now the more difficult part is actually this too, where there is a way of doing offerings. You must have heard in the news that um, Manny Pacquiao um, last September 2 did a utility coin. A utility coin is just like your Philippine Airlines rewards. Um, it's like your FSP, frequent shopper. So it's rewards points. Um, what has not been implemented on the plan of Pacquiao is actually having also a stable coin, which is not yet approved, an investment, and a payment system, but that's uh, still not launched yet. Video? Oh, the video. Um, I want to show you uh, the video of um, what's happening in China in case you guys are not yet aware. It's, it's like that in tech. You know, it's working Kanina. We tested it, right? That's the one. My time is still counting. <laughs> it's, I think it's slide nine, I think. My slide. Should I just, say <laughs> no. While we're looking for this, who's been in China in the last in the last year? Voila! Oh my goodness! Oh yeah, this one. If you go to China now, whatever you change in Chinese yuan, you will probably bring it back home with you. And the reason for that is this. Okay. China's cities are already flush with cameras. Around 200 million of them. What's changing? is they're getting smarter. China is positioning itself to lead the world in artificial intelligence. Surveillance technology is a key proving ground. Facial recognition, body scanning, and geo-tracking, matched with your personal data and online behavior, will power the social credit system, leaving no dark corner to hide in. At the World Intelligence Congress in Tianjin, Big Brother's new toys are on show. Several of the exhibitors here, including tech giant Alibaba, are now working with the state to write the algorithms that will calculate your social credit score. They've already got the know-how and the user data from their financial credit system, Alipay. Manager of Alipay Tanjing is Chong Jia. Sounds dramatic, but it's the party line. Pilot programs for a national social credit system are already underway. By 2020, the official outline boasts it will allow the trustworthy to roam freely under heaven, while making it hard for the discredited to take a single step. Okay, um, back to the slide where you had the security token. Oh, um, pause for a second. Um, in 
in, in China, and when I visited my friend in China, we went to a mall, and he just experimented, and he said, you, want, you know, I could buy that car. I, I don't have money, but I could buy that car within an hour. It's actually 30 minutes, but within an hour. And I said, well, okay, how? I'm going to apply for a loan because my, cr my social credit rating is 95. In China, it's called social credit rating. If you have everything in a QR code, all the things that you're doing, you pay your bills um, within seven days, you, you pay your um, electricity, whatever, utilities, uh, within a number of time, a time frame, which is on spot. Um, if th that's the credit, the typical, the, the bankers would know this. The social part, for argument's sake, you buy beer, like 10 beers a day, so your social credit rating will go down. If you buy, if you're a, si a mom, you're a single mom, and then you're buying nappies every day, so to speak, or once a week, and you're a single mom, your social rating will go down. It's a combination of social credit rating. If you have 95% social credit rating, you can buy that car within 30 minutes and apply for a loan online, credit it to your account, buy it, and leave the mall with your car. So that's how, when we're talking about the digital money and the globalization, this is like the future, but it's already happening. And th we are still on the baby steps. We are still on the acknowledging the QR code. Okay, so back to here. Now, there, there is phenomenal growth. We are looking at the tip of the iceberg. We're only looking at the payment system, the purchasing 7-Eleven, the grocery. That is tip of the iceberg. On the right side, what do we have? In, in other countries, they have already built unicorns, decacorn, hectocorn. The 1 billion, the 10 billion, and the 100 billion startups. And this, this is an example. Uh, um, anyone here actually uh, got an app of Blinkist? Okay, not the right, maybe not the right uh, group, but if you actually look at the millennials, I mean, uh, some of you are millennials, but you don't have it, but um, the millennials would have this. A Blinkist is an application where it's like a book and it would have blinks. It will have summary on it. What's it got to do with what I'm saying? Blinkist, these are brothers, um, Klein, and... Um, Janssen, they graduated only 2012 German um, Manberg University, did I say that right? Um, and they practically went bankrupt in 2014 because they were promoting Blinkist. But um, it just so happened in 2016, they got a funder and they got a funder through coin offering. And to date, they are worth $70 million. But this company, you know the problem when it, it, Philippines, we do have a lot of brilliant people. We do have a lot of good startups. That's why I'm happy with the innovation, startup innovation. But they don't have money for equity. Neither, when they borrow from a bank, they get denied. And unfortunately, when it comes to historically, those ones that are doing coin offerings, be watchful though. So if you think, oh, I want to invest in a coin offering, those ones doing coin offerings at this point is actually 95% scam. Not necessarily scam, but they're actually not working. Um, they're closed because statistically, new corporation or startups have difficulty surviving in the first five years anyway. So having those statistics, um, this is where what we're trying to do in the world of the digital is to get the, give that opportunity for these startups. Um, I'm actually predicting that Ancas, and they'll be happy about my prediction, will be hopefully our first Filipino-owned unicorn. Unicorn is the one billion um, uh, uh, dollar yeah, I, I'm predicting. I'm not putting a date on it yet, but I'm hoping it probably will be Ancas. Okay, but the thing is, when you, you are out there in the space, trust is a problem. In fact, if you look at these very new statistics, this is only July. A, a, 
SEC shut down 836 illegal lenders. There is a Ponzi scheme from a UK company trying to get people to invest in an online platform. Um, BSP, and this is only in the past week, take note of that, September 12th, BSP says we have to strengthen consumer protection because of all of these fly-by-night operators cropping up. Um, according to the uh, National Privacy Commission, there are now three lending firms facing jail term because of privacy, naman, privacy um, infractions. And according to the data privacy, there's a lot of complaints as well when it comes to those co complaints that they're handling at this point. So how do you actually build trust? Um, there is a, uh, they, did, they did a social experiment, five countries, five wallets, five different places. One is Japan, um, in the middle was uh, France, and one is Indonesia. And they found Japan, oh my God, five minutes, G give me 10. Um, they found Japan, five out of five wallets got returned, and Indonesia, zero out of five. And I was actually kind of pleased that Philippines wasn't included in that social stats because the credit card, if, you know, if it's in the wallet, it probably, probably would have been used as well. Um, but that's the thing. Uh, your cell phone eventually will be your wallet, you know, and this is where, how do you protect, and this is why cybersecurity is important, um, passwords are important, we have to be aware of the space because that wallet is something that, um, something that can be stolen quicker, so to speak. Um, according to the World Bank, um, IFC, and I, I, by the way, teach in the World Bank on risk, there is such thing as a fraud triangle. And the fraud triangle is composed of three things. It's ROP. R, this is very important. R is rationalization, always opportunity, and P is pressure. And the rationalization part is that part that we're trying to move away. Okay, what am I saying? There is another social experiment done in Japan where 30 grade one students, they were given chocolate cake in front of them and they were told 11.30, mind you, before lunch, don't eat it. So what they did, what do you think they did? Grade one students, not a single one ate the chocolate cake. So what is this got to do here? What we're saying is, when it comes to leaving the wallet behind, what is important is actually ethics. And that's actually good governance. In the fraud triangle, if you take the rationalization, then there's a likelihood that the fraud will not happen. That's why good governance is very important. We need to build trust in the digital world to build the ecosystem, because if we are gonna be too scared about it, it's gonna slow us down. So. Um, building trust in the digital system, I'm gonna go uh, quickly on some of the slides. We need to build an equilibrium. The banks and the IPOs are very strict where the cryptos are very easy. When I say build an e equilibrium, we have to have a proper uh, Philippine regulatory climate on this. And the revised corporation code has included the FinTech Corps um, as a public interest to be part of the governance as well. You must have heard in the news about the code of ethics uh, signed by the FinTech group. What else is happening out there in terms of regulation? BSP, they're open for a sandbox. What does sandbox mean? Test and learn. If they don't know it, it will be put on the sandbox. That was briefly explained by Jove. Um, SEC, they're looking at public consultation when they are doing their laws. Um, in fact, there is an extensive one in CESA. It's been happening in the last um, couple of years. Unfortunately, slight, you know, there's a few corporations there that have abused. Um, if you notice, the POGOs, uh, those ones that are, a lot of them got their offshore license, but using onshore, offshore license in CESA. The intent of the CESA is like Silicon Valley. But having said that, I'll park that. Um, I want to go through the, uh, just quickly, Okay, I won't go through it in the absence of time. There are actually all of these regulations, um, and if you notice, that's only in the last year to date. So we have been quite aggressive. The world is looking at Philippines. Okay, oh, I just, in terms of pop population is one of the key features, key factor that is being looked at. Um, 
The Vietnam is 96 million, we're 108, that's 140 million, we're very close to that. But certainly all the reds are in Asia, the eye of the world is actually in Asia, Philippines included. So, um, just on the positive side, um, all of this uh, news has all only been happening in the past year or so, and if you notice, the digital world is growing exponentially. Um, in the UK, startups are actually grabbing 15% of the market already, that's a two trillion market. Um, but the Philippines, we have not yet created any unicorn because we have not yet completed some of our regulation. So our recommendation, what needs to be done as far as the government? Openness, we do have the regulatory sandbox. Appropriate laws and the, Im the good implementation of the laws. Um, I could expand on that for an hour, but I'm gonna pause in there. For the businesses, um, you know, the businesses that are bad, the scammers, they're gonna be penalized, of course, but the good ones should really be rewarded. There's what we call the stick and a carrot approach, but we're adding on another approach, which is make sure these corporations embed good governance. Um, continuing education, as mentioned by Jove, is actually important, incentivizing startups. Now, startups, um, th the ones in the US, like Filecoin, that's 50,000 ROI. But when you say incentivizing, we they need to also uh, learn the viability of the business and that sort of thing. And of course, good governance. For the public, we need to be aware of the risk and the usage. The risk, uh, as mentioned, password and that sort of thing. And, and, the, and for the public, we need to retool. We are lacking good people in AI. We need more data scientists. Um, we need more um, chi chief technology officers. In, in fact, not IT people necessarily, chief tech officers. Um, preferably in big organizations and um, government institutions as well. So just to end, just like um, Elon Musk is saying, paper money is going away. We need to protect that wallet. Technology shows us what we could possibly do with the data. Laws and regulations show us what we are allowed to do. But ethics or good governance tells us what we should do. Thank you. Right, so we still have one more presenter, and uh, I, it's timely, I guess, that and we've purposely reserved her for the last session, because we want to s we w first want we want to see what's going on in the global landscape in terms of the trade war and in terms of the technology, and then we want to hear about what's going, what is the Philippines doing, or at least I'm sure we're not. Um, taking this uh, sitting down and we're not sleeping. <laughs> so we, 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 we are actually preparing our economy to handle all these. And uh, we want to hear from the executive director of the Board of Investments. Um, so Ma'am Cory, I'll call her Mam Cory because uh, I know we know each other. So is the executive director in the industry development services of the Board of Investments. She is she a career executive with 25 years in in the Board of Investments and uh, she is tasked to handle industry related matters and the policy of the agency. Uh, she has handled various assignments in the BOI from industry development to international marketing and international negotiations. So she is the best person to tell us what's the Philippines doing uh, to brave these opportunities and risks. So uh, let me call on Edie Corey. Thank you, Francis, and good afternoon po. Um, Mag-special high lang po ako sa former boss ko. The first BOI managing head and the former prime minister, Cesar Villata, sir. Good afternoon po. Mas lalo ang kinabahan, sir, nung nakita ko kayo sa, sa, ano, sa audience, actually. Um, 
So this afternoon, what I'll be discussing and maybe um, trying to focus more on the presentation actually is more related to what Ms. Chris actually uh, presented. But um, in the discussion in the different industry initiatives, maybe I'll touch also on some of the technology aspects uh, because that uh, affects also um, our industries, local industries, particularly in the Philippines, and therefore we need really to take them into consideration in a lot of our policies and interventions for industry growth. Okay, um, let me start with um, the context first. Of course, uh, the Philippines as a trading nation is um, uh, a net importer. In fact, if you will see, um, for just the, the past five years from 2014 to 2018, we've been growing in terms of trade deficit. For the past five years, it's already around 127.93 billion. And what's alarming is that um, if you look at the graph, um, that has been increasing in the last year, 2018, that has already ballooned to negative 47 billion dollars. So, Yung ating growth um, in terms of the trade balance, the trade deficit um, for the past five years has averaged 76.54 percent. So that's actually something that's quite alarming for the trade in um, for the trade department. And when we look at the sources of this trade deficit, um, we look at China as the bulk uh, contributor for this one, accounting for 32.41 percent and then followed by Korea, Indonesia, Thailand, Taipei. Um, this is um, uh, the top five sources of our trade deficit, and you will actually see they already accounted for more than 90% of our trade deficit. So if we look at the uh, products also that we do import or the top sources of this trade deficit, actually it's all in automotive, it's actually in petrochemicals, it's actually in coal, it's in steel. And if you look at these products, actually these are the major imports we do import because we don't have this. For steel, for example, particularly for the build, build, build program of the government, we do import a lot of the rebars because a lot of our steel plants actually are still starting to expand to um, cope up with the demand of our infrastructure projects. Coal, for example, we import a lot from Indonesia because our coal in Semirara have low heating value and we cannot use them in a lot of our power plants. Automotive, we do want to have an automotive sector, but apparently for the past decades we've been supporting the automotive sector, they have not really grown to a certain point that they can supply the demand of the Philippines. And you will see actually that when you look at the, um, the registrations in the Land Transportation Office, the sales of automotive has just been increasing. And whether this automotive is actually, um, you know, it would have been better if this, these autos are being done in the Philippines, then that would have contributed more to the economy. But apparently these are imported more than actually produced in the Philippines. So that actually contributes a lot to the trade deficit. Now, what's also important to see is that um, relative to our ASEAN neighbors, we actually export to the same market. So, kumbaga, parang our source of trade deficit are our neighbor co neighboring countries, and then in the markets that we go to, there's the same set of countries that we actually compete with. Particularly for Thailand, if you will see, we really export to the same markets. So. For all the ASEAN members, our major markets would be US, EU, China, and Japan. But for Thailand, even Hong Kong market is um, similar or same with the Philippines. And if you look at the, the economic structure of ASEAN, actually we have the same priority or the same industries that we support. We have electronics, we have auto, we have, um, for example, um, garments and textiles. And they're actually bigger exporting countries than the Philippines. So these are realities. So we want to establish that context because at the end of it, that would explain or that would up, um, sort of like affect or impact on what initiatives or interventions we should be doing. Okay. So the darker the red, um, the, um, the larger they are as an exporting country. Okay. So same markets, bigger exporting countries. So. Now look at the global trade tensions. As we try to 
deepen our GVs integration because that has been the, the advocacy of the Department of Trade and Industry. Deepen the global value chain integration, regional production networks, but look at the environment we're actually um, in. From October 2008, and this is based on the WTO records, there has been 8,720 trade measures that have been imposed already by different countries. So the major imposers or major um, countries imposing these trade measures have been the USA, EU, and China, which are our major markets. But more importantly to note here is that out of the 8,720, 296 have been imposed in the last seven months ending in May. So again, the three main um, players here would be the US, EU, and China. Now let's look at the trade measures they've been uh, imposing in the market. So if you will notice, both the US and the EU, they've been imposing trade remedies or trade protectionist measures. So if these are the cases that you've actually been looking at in your markets, how do you think we can export more to these markets? Or at least if we are um, the rece at the receiving end of these trade measures. So you will still see a bit of trade facilitating, maybe reduction of um, imports or tariffs, uh, but majority, 71% of the total trade measures that have been newly imposed by our markets from October 2018 to May 2019 have been trade remedies or trade protectionist measures. And what's alarming is that only in the recent uh, period from October 2017 to October 2018, the trade value covered by these trade restrictive measures have been um, 588.3 billion, and in the last seven months ending in May, that has been 339.5 billion. So that's almost one trillion in total just for the last 19 months ending in May. And sabi nga kanina ni Ms. Chris, this will not you know, um, stop or even um, relent. This will only escalate. So that means more and more of these uh, trade measures will be imposed, and therefore more of the, more of the um, trade values will be getting bigger. And so this is the global environment we're working um, actually in. Now, if you look at the different trade measures being imposed by our major markets, um, you will look here, you will actually see here that the major countries being affected by measures of the U.S., of course, expectedly, si China yung unan di on sa listahan. And then Korea, India, and then among the ASEAN countries, you have Vietnam, Thailand, and Indonesia. Wala si Philippines, fortunately. And then if you look at the top 10 members affected by measures in the EU, then again, you see China, India, and then again, Thailand and Indonesia from the ASEAN member countries, and again, fortunately, wala pa rin si Philippines. And if you look at the measures being imposed by China, again, expectedly, U.S. will be at the top of it. And then you see ASEAN member countries as Thailand, Malaysia, and Indonesia. And then fortunately, again, wala pa rin si Philippines. So, looking at all those graphs, that gives, up, gives us hope that the Philippines is actually, should be, one of those beneficiary countries of this U.S.-China trade war, diba? Ang nakakalungkot lang sa sinabi ni Ms. Chris kanina, um, if we will benefit, it will be very small compared to the other Asian countries. So, yun yung kailangan nating ayusin. <coughs> so, eto lang, I just once like to see how our other um, big Asian economies also compare with um, the trade measures being imposed. So makikita nyo talaga si Philippines yung least affected. If you look at the measures imposed since 2008, um, Thailand has the longest line at 701 and then si Indonesia at 628. And the recent past ending in May 2019, tayo walang bagong measures imposed on the Philippines. Si Vietnam has 3, Thailand has 18, si Malaysia has 7, and Indonesia has 15. Okay, again, this points to some opportunities for the Philippines only if we play it right. Now, looking at the U.S.-China trade war, um, yun yung sinasabi natin na because of the trade deficit that ballooned na nga to 419 billion in 2018, 
this was the time already that U.S. started imposing a lot of sanctions on the China imports. Okay. So, if you look at the different products that China exports to the U.S., ang mapapansin nyo, very few na lang yung products that will be free from a lot of the trade sanctions of the U.S. So, mineral products na lang po yung substantially um, not affected by the impositions and then some of the chemicals. And this, if we look at the total, only 4% of the total exports of China to the U.S. will not be covered by trade sanctions or trade remedies. A big portion of that already has been imposed or will be imposed effective December 15 of this year. Okay. And then for China tariffs naman against U.S. imports, makikita nyo rin po some of the products that are being exported to the U.S. Um, to China are also facing higher tariffs compared to the other countries that are exporting to China. Siguro sa auto pa lang, pareho lang tayo 12.6, but again, this may change because they're looking at it as well. So the big bulk of what China imposed actually are on the agricultural. So na mention yung soybeans, for example, um, U.S. exports a lot of soybeans to China as well, and uh, China uses that. So nangyari na lang, in some of the trade facilitating measures, they lowered tariffs to other sources of soybean. Instead of getting it from the U.S., they're getting it now from South America. Okay, so dahil dun sa U.S.-China trade war, a lot of studies have been done to look at the companies that are fleeing China because this has been a very um, parang, um, something that we're trying to look at because we want to also take to want to take part in the in this um, investments that are actually relocating from China to somewhere just to access still the US and the EU markets. So this is actually a study that was done by Nomura. And I said that of the more than 50 companies fleeing China, a lot of them still went to Vietnam. So kung makikita nyo, meron silang 26. And then the next one was Taiwan. And the others would have, say, for example, Thailand at 8. And then some would even go to U.S. Um, 3 and then Mexico 6. Philippines got 3. Yun. So at least meron po tayo. But again, um, we're not happy with it in the Department of Trade and Industry, and therefore, um, this is something that we're trying to do with, in the last past few months, umiikot po talaga kami, uh, hoping that we can get more of the investments. Um, again, just to focus on two sectors, kasi nabanggit kanina, if ever we will benefit, it will be more in the electronic sector. And actually, that is happening already. Um, in a recent chips, actually, more of the companies that, we're that we are getting and having some production relocated to the Philippines are actually in the electronic sector. So, ito lang po, um, some EIU study, they said that for electronics, which is the infotech sector, Vietnam and Malaysia could benefit the most from the trade escalation, particularly in the low-end manufacturing of technology products, such as intermediate components and the manufacturing of consumer goods like mobile phones and laptops. What's going for Malaysia and Vietnam actually are because there are also a lot of U.S., Japanese, and Korean electronics companies already in their countries. So even if um, um, they relocate some of the production from China, they don't have to set up a new because they have their own production there. They can just expand the volume um, set up an expansion facility, they don't have to redeploy investments. So that's one um, particular uh, benefit or one particular advantage that Malaysia and Vietnam has in terms of electronics. In the Philippines po, we're actually part of the disruption. So sabihin tayo yung, yung um, magbe-benefit but not to the extent that we want to. What we have in the Philippines are more of the assembly. We don't have really a lot of the high value portion or the value chain of the electronics. We do a lot of packaging and assembly, but we need more of the higher value services and even IC design sana. Then we can get more of the electronics companies in the Philippines. And then in terms of automotive, this is one of the three sectors they looked at. So automotive, they see the Philippines will be in the middle with mild benefits. 
and particularly they see Malaysia and Thailand as benefiting most in terms of the auto war that's happening between US and China because very important then to look at is that Malaysia and, uh, and Thailand have very deep, very um, comprehensive supply chain in terms of the automotive sector. They have there from auto electronics to a lot of metal parts to a lot of plastics and they even have metro me petrochemical in there. They have steel industry also in those countries. So it's easier also for some of the companies to deploy their resources just to expand volumes of production in Malaysia and Thailand rather than set up new investments in certain countries. And in Malaysia and Thailand, they also have not just the Japanese brands, they also have the European and the US brands. So, yun po yung mga advantages natin. Advantages nila, that's why, um, again, they were determined to be the most countries that will benefit. But, of course, we looked at China, but again, remember, US is doing other battles as well. So, they have also against Canada, this was also mentioned by Ms. Chris earlier, they also have battles with the EU, with Japan, with India, Turkey, and Mexico. So again, these are markets that are imposing um, trade measures against the U.S. in retaliation. And yung kanina natin na pinag-usapan na trade deficit, um, that can be solved if we probably export more or import less. But whether that's possible in our case, we don't really know unless we really have very good supply chain in the country. So, so far, what has been the impact on the Philippines? In 2017, we were able to grow our exports to the world at 19.7%. In 2018, when the trade war started, we only increased by 0.9%. So, we're sabihin, get, we're getting hit already by the trade war. To the U.S. market, we expanded 9.1%. In 2018, that was 10.1%. And then in China, in the Chinese market, that was 25.8% growth. But in 2018, that was only 10%. Nag-grow pa rin naman siya. But again, there were adjustments being made then in 2018. And therefore, we got also affected by the rate of growth in the Chinese market. And in terms of the approved investments, dahil China has to look for other places to do their production, so that they can still access the large US market, they're trying to invest in other countries as well. And in the BOI, we were able to register 48 billion of investments just coming from China in the last year. And these are actually in the iron and steel sector. Because if you will recall in the presentation earlier, the steel products were the first ones that were imposed by trade sanctions by the US. So the Chinese um, thought that maybe if we go to the Philippines and export to the U.S., that will actually solve their problems in terms of accessing steel, the U.S. market for steel products. Now, in terms of the, um, there. So for the DTI, in solving the trade deficit and trying to see how we can actually benefit more from the U.S. trade war, we think that the best trade strategy is a robust industrialization policy. If you will recall, I mentioned earlier that those countries who will benefit more from the relocation are those with very good supply chains, those that were um, very good in terms of um, infrastructure and logistics, which are actually very good in the other ASEAN countries. So in the DTI, we think that um, the industrial development policy will be the key to a lot of these things that's quite happening. Even in um, trying to elevate our industries to keep up with the technology. Regional integration through lowering of tariffs and trade facilitation promotes seamless global value chains, meaning we cannot do what the US and China are doing. We will not, will not go to protectionist um, measures. We will always stay free, but we will ensure that there will be a level trade um, playing field for all of us. And therefore, we will not hesitate to impose trade remedies as we see necessary also. In fact, if you will recall, earlier we already imposed trade remedies on cement. So any imports coming from Vietnam, which is a heavy source of cement in the Philippines, will now be imposed additional tariffs as well. And we'll be doing that for other products as well in the coming, in the coming months. And who will benefit the most? It really depends on who has the deepest production capabilities? Again, I mentioned supply chains, very important. 
and the widest network of supplying industries um, in the country. Now, what's going for us, and we think this is something that we can actually bet on, is that we have a very expansive market access. We have a network of FTAs. We have ASEAN. We have the regional plus one with Japan. We have a bilateral FTA with EFTA, or these are Switzerland, Norway, Liechtenstein, and, and Iceland. We have um, a regional FTA with Australia, China, Korea, India, and New Zealand as well. And we enjoy GSP beneficiary uh, plus status with EU. That means more than 6,000 uh, tariff lines of our products are enjoying zero uh, tariff in the EU market. And uh, we also enjoy uh, benefits from the e US GSP, Russia, and Canada. We're also, as shown in the data before, less vulnerable to trade war. None of the recent trade measures have been imposed on the Philippines or targeting the Philippines. Our pH exports account for only 15% of GDP. Actually, ito yung, um, what we're saying is we're quite strong in terms of domestic demand. We're not very dependent on exports, and that has actually saved us from being heavily affected by a lot of global recession and global slowdown. But again, we cannot stay as, as such. We have to grow as an economy as well. And so um, what we're trying to do really is still tap on the different FTAs that we have. And it's good because we have strong economic relations with both the U.S. and China. As mentioned earlier, we have a U.S. Um, GSP privilege. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to announce um, soon that we'll probably have a PHUS FTA as well. Um, this is something that we're trying to mention to our partners because this is something that most of them, particularly um, garments manufacturers and electronic sector, are also looking for. Um, currently, we're doing PH Korea. Hopefully, we can conclude it before the year ends. So again, these are matters that we're trying to do so that we can um, reduce our trade deficit. And again, our commitment to reforms, particularly in the ease of doing business. So these are the different industry development initiatives we're, we're doing. So we're creating an enabling in business environment. Aside from the ARTA, um, we're also doing a lot of interventions. We offer a network of um, investment promotion units in 36 different agencies. We can be your focal person. So in the BOI, we don't offer our services only for BOI registered enterprises. Any businessman, any investor can go to the BOI, access our services, and we can actually help you resolve your issues with agencies like the BIR, the BOC, the um, DOF, um, SEC. So these are 36 agencies that we work with. Intensify industry promotion strategy. What we're doing right now, and this has been approved by the cabinet, is really intensify our overseas business missions, um, number one of which is Taiwan. A lot of the country, a lot of the companies actually in Taiwan are really trying to look for relo um, relocating um, their factories in areas because they're really having problems accessing the market because of their China production sites. So far, we've been able to get big and medium, uh, medium companies from Taiwan, and they're setting up in the Batangas area, more of the industrial parks there. So we're hoping that we can get more. In fact, we're having another Taiwan business mission this October, and uh, hopefully um, word will spread, and uh, we'll get more of these business missions coming from Taiwan. But we're also going to Hong Kong also as a way of getting some more companies uh, relocated to the Philippines. Um, enhanced local value added, this is something that we're trying to work with a lot of the companies. We're working with the World Bank right now to strengthen our supplier development um, programs. We're trying to match SMEs to multinational companies and we're doing reverse trade fairs so that we can try to um, tailor fit the requirements of the MNEs with the capabilities and capacity building that we do for the SMEs. And we've done this for, auto sec for the auto sector. We've done um, a reverse trade fair with BMW just, um, just, just June. And we were able to match BMW with a lot of the auto electronic sector um, in the country. And of course, more important is the development of the human resource. I just got alarmed with the last slide of uh, Doc Shell Habito earlier. Um, I was just telling him that, you know, in our promotion, we always say we have a large pool of talent in the Philippines, 
um, even if, for example, we export a lot of them, we still have a large pool and that every year we graduate like 700 people or graduates a year. But then I, I, I thought about the presentation of Doc Shell and I said, if, we'll st if we're going to still export a lot of our Filipinos and there will still be a lot of Filipinos in the country, who would the Filipinos be that will be retained in the country? And will that be the right labor pool for the incoming investments in the country? Again, um, that was a realization for us. Again, in DTI, maybe we would have to do a lot more of convergence with our educational institutions. Uh, maybe DOH because it's, um, it's a matter of malnutrition because uh, we, won't, we, we don't want our human resource to be a time bomb. We've always said that our human resource, our population of 107, 108 people is actually a demographic speed spot. So um, again, these are what we're doing in the BOI and particularly because our goal is to create a better future for the Filipinos in the Philippines rather than send them abroad. So thank you. I've actually overstepped my time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Edie Corey. So now may I invite uh, all our speakers on stage so that we can proceed with the open forum. So in the interest of time, may I invite you to uh, please introduce yourself and make your questions um, short and sweet. Yes, sir. and also to the rest too. Now, uh, our rating as far as competitiveness is concerned, we are ranked uh, number six on the ASEAN. And the uh, Banco Central says uh, FDI slowed down. And uh, another report says that the, on the automotive industry, some of the exporters of study the global value chain of our products. And I've read it in a very good uh, value chain study. I don't know why we did not implement this uh, recommendation from Duke University. Because, uh, you know, we have to avail also of the expertise of uh, some people. Like China, behind the people of China are American consultants. of this to study this very well. And you mentioned uh, we have, uh, like in UP alone, more than 120 scientists. But the World Bank commented, our problem is that we didn't have enough R&D centers. So uh, these are challenges. I don't know how <coughs> DTI and BOI will address these challenges so that we can have a better future for a country, not standard. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, can I get another question? So we'll we'll get two at a time, and then we'll go back to our speakers to two, two, three. So may may I invite another question? There was a question. Um, I, I was sitting next to uh, Mr. Cesar Virata, and and he actually asked a question about the 
the um, Sari Sari stores um, inclusion? Maybe that can be tackled. Okay. Because yeah, um, I, I missed, I, I ran out of time talking that one. All right. So may I first revert back to E.D. Corey and then um, Ma'am Imelda will talk about the question on yeah. Sari Sari stores. Um, yung, thank you, sir. And binasa niyo pala yung Duke University studies namin. Um, actually, we have a lot of studies in the DTI. Um, and of course, we try to look at the recommendations and we try to prioritize. Um, because, you know, as you know, in government, um, medyo limited lang yung resources namin. And the engagement with Duke University was quite a short time that was paid by the USAID. Um, but uh, nonetheless, um, yung iba naman um, initiatives namin, like yung minention nga ng innovative startup, um, yung uh, innovation app, these are all coming in. And we're also trying to already facilitate the um, finalization of the IRRs. Um, even the one person, a corporation under the revised uh, corporation code, was a welcome um, uh, law uh, for us. Kasi this will really... Um, um, provide a stimulus for a lot of our um, startups. In the yes. BOI po kasi, what we're working on right now is also to update our law because that has been a law that's, um, that was crafted in 1987 and it has a lot of, for example, equity restrictions. Mm -hmm. yep. um, we do provide incentives but in a very limited way. So some of the recommendations po, we can, only we can also do them but before we can do them, the lot also of uh, policy reforms that we need to do po as well. So, but, but just to say that we're looking at it, it's just that um, it may take a while before we can do a lot of them, but it's not only the source of what we need to do because in the BOI, we also have more than 36 industry roadmaps. And um, in the roadmaps po, we also, um, have a lot of priorities which were selected by mismong mga industry associations po natin. So if they see that the Duke University is quite, um, hindi pa siya masyadong realistic in the current situation, actually we don't take it pa po. Uh, yun. Um, in terms of the... So, dun lang po sa ibang in, um, interventions ng BOI, aside from the incentives that we grant, uh, we also do a lot of uh, capacity building po for our industries. In fact, for agribusiness po, sabi niyo po, taga agri din po kayo, um, we do a lot of convergence with the Department of Agriculture because we think that if we promote agribusiness, it should not be supporting imported agriculture. We should always um, also provide a lot of um, assistance to increase agricultural productivity natin. And uh, the appointment of a secretary there is actually a welcome one for us. And in terms of research and development naman po, we're working closer now than ever before with the Department of Science and Technology. Um, in fact po, we have a lot of new facilities in the DOST in Bikutan. The latest one po, which will, they will open, I think this, or next week, September, is the new Additive Manufacturing Center po. That will be the national center for all 3D printing activities po of the country. So um, we launched it in March. It's going to be um, headed by a field um, scientist po, si Dr. Gobet Advincola. So that is something that we're looking forward to because that will facilitate a lot of prototyping in our manufacturing sector. So yung sinabi na fab lab po in some of the um, universities and regions in the country, this is actually a shared investment po of DOST and DTI also po. So yun po, marami po kaming ganon. We call it differently. We have innovation labs, we have fab labs, we have um, um, call co-working spaces, meron po kaming mga ganon just to also um, encourage a lot of our industries to innovate. And in fact po, for the next, next year, we're cooperating with our electronics uh, industry in trying to already encourage a lot of our manufacturing companies to open up and see how Internet of Things can actually help them in their manufacturing. So that will be June in um, next year po, 
we're hoping that the electronic sector, the semiconductor industry in the Philippines will be able to help a lot of our manufacturing companies, particularly the SMEs, in trying to understand how to be IoT and AI in this um, globalized world. Po. So, yeah. thank you. Po. Okay, thank you. Yeah, may, may I add, add on something on this, which is, it may sound simplistic, but at this point,
the technology on contracts is connected to Ethereum. And, and uh, Ethereum is baby of Bitcoin, which is, of course, blockchain. While the technology is superior, there are some, um, now I wouldn't call it lapses, but slowness when you're, you're uh, referring to major transactions. Um, I, I actually forgot the statistics. Uh, but having said that, why do you think um, Facebook uh, create, is creating or created Libra? Why did they pirated the president of PayPal? So you look into that, there is, a, and, and by the way, they bought the UK blockchain uh, company as well. And that's when they actually put it all together and put that in um, under the, the Libra, which at, at the moment is being checked out and be because of the lack of regulation, so to speak. So I hope that answers it. I'm, I'm doing macro, but it's, it's like this. It's just like an app. It's a transfer. The transfer in itself is done through blockchain. And therefore, it will be done um, in a transparent, um, and immutable uh, format. Do you want to add on to that one? I'm trying to do it as layman's terms as best that I can. I'll, I'll tack it from an another angle by answering also the gentleman's question. So uh, more than 100 million Filipinos, 44 million, 45 million the labor force, two to three million remittance uh, or OFWs or double that. Why am I getting to that number? Because most of the, the information, the uh, discussion revolve around trade. When in fact, I'll, I'll, we are not a trading nation. <laughs> we are a service economy. More than 50% of our GDP is services. And so if you want to look forward to the future, we will have, of course, a diversified economy better. But the reality is that um, we need to upscale our human resources because these drive services, and in particular, ICT, BPO, and that's the future. And therefore, um, when we talk of uh, how to move forward and catch up in the global economy, we're not in the trade war, we're not significantly affected nor benefiting because we are not in that space. Our playbook is develop the human resources, develop the skills, be the work force, the workhorse of the service economy. Therefore, investments should flow into that. Therefore, our education system, our healthcare system, um, government would support that. Such as about also bringing in FDI, it's also creating value domestically by having startups that also become exporters of these intellectual uh, products. So when we now talk of uh, blockchain and these uh, AI and other technologies, these are the emerging technologies where we can actually have a leg up over our export-oriented, manufacturing-oriented neighbors. So at the end of the day, when you now talk of specific technologies, let's say blockchain, the applications are, Im are, uh, are, are immense. So we, we've seen how money can be digitalized and how that digital money can actually have use cases in the banking sector. And that's what we mentioned a while ago when Union Bank is saying they launched their stable coin, which is linked to the Philippine peso. Uh, that's one application. Another application is that in law, for example, in legal contracts, you don't need pen and paper. That can be codified in a smart contract using blockchain. And why blockchain? Because it is transparent and immutable, meaning that anybody can look into that, those transactions are recorded, anybody who tries to hack destroys the chain of information. Those are just specific technologies, but when enhanced in a macroeconomic level, means that we can actually fundamentally reshape our business relationships. Because when you now talk of business relationships, these are put in contracts. Mm -hmm. But what if they're put in software, in code? And that's why we need more blockchain developers, data scientists, AI people, etc. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's it. I kind of want to add on to that, that um, we're not in trade or in either manufacturing in terms of competitiveness. 
Um, I'm sure you know the root cause of why we're not competitive. It's one of them is expensive tax, expensive um, electricity, and uh, what have you. So if if everything is actually, if a government is collecting sufficient, and if we do have a lot of talents, and all these FDIs going in, and by the way, before the popular is, um, uh, uh, racing through stock exchange, and then the, the next popular is bond issuance. The coin offerings is actually becoming popular in the world. 77% goes to the bank, and practically um, that 77%, uh, more than half of it is going blockchain. So what I'm saying is we have it in the Philippines. We, partida pa, no? we don't have it yet. But it can grow, assuming that we have the proper regulations and all of these investors. And uh, we've seen them because we've we've gone around the, uh, the world, so to speak. No, and they are really looking at Philippines. But just some of them are on the wait and see, on seeing what regulations, how openness. Knee jerk when Gojek was rejected or being checked out by the Philippine Competition Commission, that had a knee jerk effect to a lot of the investors saying, "Okay, well, Philippines is anti-competitive." And therefore, that, so a few of the investors are pulling out, thinking, "Okay, we'll wait for the the uh, data token offering and the data asset exchange." There are two laws coming up with Banco Central and SEC, so uh, they are on a wait and see. But we think, um, and you're quite correct with the statistics and having China improving in the Philippines and the tie-ups and all of that. Given all that and having a more competitive tax and utilities, electricity, and what have you, labor, I think Philippines is really one of the countries that will zoom up. Um, competitiveness, we're down 124, uh, but with the new Artha law, I believe we're going to go up. Um, and so we, we have steps, and I'm very pleased with the present administration actually um, doing steps and doing things about it, and open to discussing and hand in hand with industries like us. Um, emerging industries uh, talking and in fact we are a big voice in a few of the regulations as well and we would like to continue having a voice as well all right so thank you very much I, I, I appreciate the response to my question uh, I was also thinking about maybe the applications to customs you know it's like this they probably wouldn't like it yeah but you know <laughs> transparency and you know all these things. Anyway, uh, questions? Oh, yes, sir. Yes, uh, thank you to the uh, presenters, uh, Ted Daniel from the GFA. Uh, listening to, well, I'm a layman, but uh, listening to the discussions, there appears to be, and since I've been in government for quite a long time, that um, the emerging industries uh, would seem to be a much quicker way to uh, jumpstart or uh, in increase what the country is earning, uh, given the proper uh, regulations. Uh, whereas our traditional um, investment uh, schemes or uh, ways of trying to jumpstart our manufacturing sector uh, is much slower, uh, particularly there's still a lot of regulations and, and laws that need to be, to pa be passed, plus the fact that uh, the GTI just said that we have so many 36 uh, different uh, priority area programs. Um, so, and Jumping off on what you were saying, maybe the Philippines is still stuck in that paradigm where a country should have a very strong manufacturing uh, sector in order for it to progress to the next economic level. Whereas if we uh, focused on the emerging technologies where we have a very young population uh, who would probably be quite quick to pick up uh, any of the uh, skills needed. Um, maybe there should be a conversation yep, within government. Yeah, maybe. maybe to reduce the number of the 36 to focus uh, on a fewer number that will really uh, probably be the most successful in the shortest possible time and then really devote more time on the yeah. 
emerging uh, technologies. Um, because 10 years ago, who ever heard of the Pocos? Yeah. Uh, and all of a sudden, it's next to Cobra Tech and BPO. Yeah. So we can't, as you said, we can't deny that our economy is really service-based. Yeah. And to try and go back to the manufacturing base of the uh, yeah. the before the fourth industrial revolution might be the, a step backward. So a conversation has to be yeah. made and a decision taken uh, to maybe reorient uh, our, our yeah. directions. Yeah. Any response? Yeah. yeah. Sir, if, if I may just quickly comment on that one. Um, let's be also be careful because um, even without the tech, startups are generally only one out of five will survive in the next five years. Mm -hmm. So we would we need to also look fairly closely at those ones that you know, we have, to, and, and this is good with a big, uh, board of investments, with um, DTI, with um, I, the innovation law, it, it, it includes um, training. Um, for them to know the business, the strategies, and that sort of thing. So that's actually very good. We also be, uh, have to be made aware that with the technology comes responsibility. And that's a little bit unfortunate that today we are being looted at. Even China is saying, hey, you know, Philippines, you know, parang you're promoting money laundering. Um, can you please stop the licenses on the, on the offshore gaming? So um, we have to balance it out and find that, that equilibrium that we're referring to and, and just ensure that we do have proper regulations, but at the same time, not too strict, but not too easy. Um, so as Philippines is not looked at as a bad country and, and a place where you can do laundering. So. Maybe Corey? Yeah. Um, thank you for the comment. No, actually, those are 36 na binention ko. Those are industry roadmaps. Um, we all we have priorities. In fact, um, it's just that we're not publicly stating which are the priorities. But you can actually see them in the um, Philippine Development Plan. The roadmaps have been submitted by the private sector. And alam mo naman as a public servant, everybody is your boss. Um, everybody would always demand. Um, your time, for example, to solve a lot of their ease of doing business. So this roadmap actually is just sort of like a blueprint where both government and the private sector look at. But since these are crafted by the private sector, of course, government has to balance the interest. And in industry, there's always one industry association on both ends. And sometimes their positions are not converging. So. So yung, yung dun sa 36 roadmaps, uh, we're doing that um, and um, we have different levels of engagement. Um, in terms of the manufacturing, um, we've actually recognized naman that we have been a services country for the past how many years? And we have ITBPM to thank for that. But unfortunately, there's also a big bulk in our labor pool that cannot go into the ITBPM sector, particularly if even in fintech, ako lang nalolos ako sa discussions ni ma'am. Diba? So we need also some jobs to be created for the low-skilled or semi-skilled workers. And in, in an ADB study before which we subscribed to in 2012, we cannot walk on just one leg. Agriculture, nandun yon because we're an agri-country. But in terms of growth, I think we, walk, we have to walk on two legs. So that's both manufacturing and services. Some of the services requirements kasi medyo high-end na siya. But for those in the manufacturing sector, we can get even the K-12 graduates, the high school graduates, and then we can provide them jobs. So I think we have to have both. Um, we're, we also recognize that we have a lot of problems in terms of cost competitiveness. But again, we have to be very selective in terms of the sector because not all the manufacturing sectors are power intensive. There can be spots there that we can look at, and maybe Philippines can make um, um, maybe um, a, a niche, establish a niche, um, and maybe we can be part of the global value chain. But again, these are things that we need to look at with the private sector because uh, at the end of it, it's always the private sector that will take the opportunities that go with it in terms of market access. Thank you. I'd like to add. Okay. Yes, sir. So maybe um, for Industry 4.0 and a fusion of services and manufacturing, uh, let's take a look at 3D, techno 3D printing technology. So there's already going, they're going to launch an advanced um, additive uh, manufacturing lab. Mm -hmm. uh, so what I'm saying here is that's an element of manufacturing. 
the differentiator is not the technology, it will be the creativity of the design that goes into the additive, uh, to, um, the tool that will be used, uh, the production. Um, so there can be that fusion where we are entering an age of mass customization with the use of additive technology. And that additive technology is not necessarily limited to only one set or two sectors. It can be across all the manufacturing uh, sectors because if you can mass produce or mass customize a component, say, of a car, of an electronics, a cell, of a phone, or, or some other electronics uh, product, then we can be cost competitive because now we are talking of creative design, mm -hmm. which is human-centered. Yeah, and also services. And right. also a service. Yeah, because magaling tayo Francis, sa design. Ko lang. Um, in, one, in some of our discussions lang po kasi, we, we always say, and DTI has been a champion of the fourth industry revolution, di ba? But, um, and we've always been compared to the other countries. Um, but if you look at it, and this is actually some of the discussions that are ongoing, Philippines kasi, we have to create a lot of jobs in the Philippines. Now, whether we are going straight into automation, IoT, AI, um, sabi nga natin, that would create some job displacement. Whether the job creation will actually be um, as fast as the job displacement, hindi ko alam kung kaya natin sa gobyerno ngayon, o kami sa gobyerno ngayon. So, yung, yung whether we can go there to for IR agad, um, sabi nga nila, for some Hindi siguro at this point in time, mm -hmm. maybe we can try to prepare the path. But when we go there, kasi, that means we have to double time in terms of the job creation. And I don't know whether we have that capacity given the current industry structure that we have. Um, and we're still implementing K-12, which would actually put at par a lot of our educational um, system with the other countries. So yun po, um, I, I know we've been talking a lot of this um, for IR, but again, um, one question that always arises is if we adapt that, we will do a lot of job displacements. Can we do um, job creation as fast as we can, uh, as we do job displacement with for IR? Yun lang po. Gusto ko sanang magsalita eh, pero <laughs> para may debate naman. <laughs> but we're already experiencing job displacement sooner than later. So the point is, if in two to three years, one third of the BPO uh, or even the call center workforce are decimated, mm. the, we cannot do it incremental step by incremental step anymore. Something radical has to be done. Okay, so as the chair, maybe <laughs> I will stand in the middle, no, <laughs> figuratively. But okay, uh, but. I'm sorry, but we need to cut it because there's also a plenary in the afternoon that I, I also don't want anyone to miss because we've also invited high-profile people. Uh, but so let me just end this uh, session by saying that I think what we really should have is a dialogue between the private sector and the Department of Trade and Industry and the, the public sector so that we can actually find areas where we can um, build on things. and. Also, as a final note, um, I take the words of the Undersecretary of DTI, Yusek Perry, when he said that maybe we, we should not just look at Industry 4.0, but Industry 4.0 factorial. So 4, 3, 2, 1, it, well, 4 or 3 or 2. Because at least we can see where if we can only reach Industry 3.0, then maybe up to here we try to adjust, and then prepare the steps to reaching Industry 4.0. So as, um, as the chair of the session, uh, I thank you for coming, and I hope you learned a lot from the, se from the session, and you um, thank you very much, and please stay for the last plenary.